Welcome to Risk Roundup. Over the years, the computing systems have delivered tremendous benefits. As they continue to do so, the emerging computing systems, cognitive systems, is expected to forever change the way we, the humans, will interact with computers and computing systems in all formats. The rise of con cognitive computing brings us a new age where computers with human-like cognitive abilities works hand in hand with humans in solving complex problems facing humanity. As computers begin to think like human beings, they will undoubtedly increase our capabilities, reach and knowledge and allow us to make accurate predictions, gather enormous amounts of data and draw intelligent conclusions. So does this mean that we are moving into an era where computers can augment human knowledge and ingenuity in entirely new ways? It seems so. There is a growing belief that the time is coming soon when we will be able to address smartphones, computers, smart cars, smart enterprises, smart homes, smart cities, and get a real thoughtful and intelligent response rather than a pre-programmed one as we have seen over the years. Since cognitive computing brings us a potential for applications across nations and all its components, that is government, industries, organizations, and academia, in short referred to as NGIOA, there is a great hope that the cognitive era is going to transform how we live, how we work, how we think, and also how we achieve security in cyberspace, geospace, and space by bringing us an intelligent future. To discuss cognitive computing further, I'm delighted to welcome Patricio Julian Harpe to Risk Roundup. Patricio is a high-tech entrepreneur, co-CEO of Siuk, an autom automation solution company, co-founder of the Argentine AI community, writer, a startup mentor, and also a TEDx speaker. He's based in UK. Welcome, Patricio. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Well, first of all, as said before, I am very grateful to be part of here of this discussion. I think it's very critical to have this kind of discussions. Um, yes, that your description is, is true. And I would be delightful to, to start, start from the beginning, try to understand what exactly is cognitive computing, uh, because unfortunately there's a lot of hype and um, misunderstanding towards the um, communication of what this technology is, how it's become the history of um, cognitive computing and how uh, different people, scientists um, from different fields came up with uh, cognitive science and how it evolved to what is known as today. Wonderful. Well, that's what we are hoping for from this discussion, that our global viewers and listeners get an accurate understanding about what it is and what it is not. So let's start with the current state of computing, discussion on current state of computing. Over the years, we have witnessed computing systems that have been part of all components of a nation and its initiatives. We have seen from smart cars to personal assistants, computers that can already read, write, speak, see, hear, and learn. But the big question so far was, can computing systems understand? And for a machine or computing system to be truly intelligent, it's not enough for it to simply know the words we have said in different formats. It needs to understand and be able to know what we want. So do you think machines have that capability today? Can they understand? Are they becoming intelligent because of this cognitive computing? Well, I think there are different movements or different sh shift in this technology. I think there are like six main points in this. The first of all, there's an increase in computing powers. Uh, to get you an idea, um, what, what measure computer power is called FLOPS, which basically is the calculation that can be done per seconds. Uh, to get you an idea, uh, the DESI scale, which is the lowest, is like the human calculation with a pen or on paper, what the human can calculate with a pen of paper. It's uh, five uh, multiplied by 10 to the power of minus five. Now we are getting, according to the law, um, the law of Moore, which is uh, the exponential growth of computer power over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, is getting to what is known as um, exascale computing. 
For instance, the Bitcoin network hash rate has reached 1.5 hertz hashes per second over the last year, which is an amazing computing power. And this is getting more and more, which enables new technologies as, for example, deep learning. Then you have another phenomena, which is the big data. Big data, it's uh, the huge volume of data that have been evolved over the last years. How this phenomenon is explained? Well, in 2003, uh, Jeremy Griffin, which is a, a, sociolog a sociologist, uh, he coined the term digital revolution, which is the transition from old analogical technologies to digital technologies. This enable a lot of data creation. And also, of course, then you have the social media. Uh, for instance, there's a really interesting fact. Um, this is backed by the MC, MS, M, EMC report in 2014, which is known as the rich value and increasing value of IoT, that states that our data, it's doubling in size every two years. So we expect by 2020, an amount of the di digital universe, which is all the data created and copied annually, will reach 44 zettabytes. That means 44 trillion gigabytes. Imagine how many uh, harvests would be that. So that is a second phenomenon. But it's also, there's another main point of this shift in computing that is um, the shift in AI. So normally AI was understood as expert systems, like a lot of hand code, uh, if then statements, heuristics, but now they're moving towards machine learning, uh, which are systems that improve performance by experience, computer stacks such, such as classification, regression, anomaly detection, clustering, evolve machine learning. Then you have deep learning. We don't have the manual feature extraction. Uh, but deep learning is not new. And then I will come back to where it begins. Then, of course, you have the quantum computing early stages. IBM is developing the IBM quantum experience. Then you have Google from quantum AI. Then you have decentralized and distributed computation, which is critical to understand the movement in AI. For instance, Google, over the last year, uh, the deep learning um, department have benefited a lot from a method of splitting computer tasks among many, many machines. This is known as federated learning, which is critical to the decentralization of computer power, making computers more secure and more powerful. Another initiative that must be described is open mind. And then most important, what I, I think, then you have a, compu a computing transition, a movement transition. And I think this movement transitions came back, back in, in 1948, when it was the Hitson Symposium. The Hitson Symposium was a conference, a scientific conference developed in the United States where different people from different fields, scientists, psychologists, um, programmers from different fields, uh, philosophy, anthropology, linguistics, they, they started to try to analyze behavior in terms of computation. Uh, and this was against the movement of behavioralists that says that um, for certain information, you have an input and then you react, like an animal reaction. Uh, people from this movement thought that there was something more. The human brain uh, do something more than reaction to, to inputs. Then you, you, you have Macula computational, uh, that states you have computational process of information. Von Neumann makes the analogy of brain computer. Lashley, which is psychology, started to talk about cognitive science. Cognitive science, it's the start, like the beginning of cognitive computer. We, you can't talk about cognitive computer without mentioning what is cognitive science. Finally, in 
1956 was the official creation of the cognitive science in the MIT symposium. And um, the cognitive science was defined as an interdisciplinary science that involved anthropology, psychology, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, linguistic, and philosophy to understand how the human process information. So uh, I said that deep learning is not exactly something new. And this is because in 1943, uh, Makula Pitts presented what is known as the mathematical model of artificial neurons. This is when uh, we start talking about um, input layers, hidden layers, weight, active action function. Um, and this was the beginning of deep learning. So I think these are the, the six shifts in computer at the moment that enable what is now know of cognitive computing that of course we can define and describe what is exactly cognitive computing yes no that is such an excellent background and you are right that the advances have been ha happening over the years in each different discipline on its own but then the sort of integration started happening people start from all disciplines started working together to bring us the reality where we are right now in cognitive computing so from your assessment, what is it that allows cognitive computing to mimic the functioning of human brain? They are all working together, neuroscientists and computer scientists, and all this, uh, they are trying to understand how to make uh, a computer brain which is similar to human brain. So what kind of uh, technology advances has made that possible today? Okay, I think that in order to answer that question, you you don't need to, to focus in the solution, but in the problem. I think you can define a technology from what the problem that solves, of the types of problem that solves. And for me, mostly, it's, it's absolutely true. I think uh, my definition of cognitive computing would be uh, that cognitive computer refers to the discipline of signal processing tasks executed by a computer, aiming to make basic mental processes normally associated with humans limited to the cognitive aspect of them. So uh, I think the problem that solves cognitive computing is uh, basically decision-making, decision-making problems. It's enabled people or other agents to have better understanding of, the, of, of solutions. And I say this because I, I think that life is like a set of complex decision-making environments. When you have a high volume of data, there are different signal stimuli, stimuli competing to catch your attention. You have multiple goal trade-offs, outcomes, dilemmas, actions of other agents that can influence what you do. You have, um, you have to make multiple decisions in record time. No, that, that's, that's life. Uh, humans need to make a lot of decisions, a lot of time to give consideration, a lot of information. But optimizing the utility of, of having the best optimal decision is a really tough task. And then that is when cognitive computing comes into play to solve these kind of um, problems where you have uh, multiple attributes, multiple criteria, multiple options, multiple agents, and, and different variables that it's very difficult for human to, to analyze all at once. Very true, very true, because the data, it is so enormous, the big data that we are collecting. So uh, you are right that it is all about decision making. So when we talk about these cognitive computing models, how accurate are they today as compared to how the human brain, mind and senses, reasons and response to stimulus, like how we respond to different data and the different, you know, pictures or different uh, uh, senses or different, you know, environmental uh, factors. How are the comp computer models, these cognitive com uh, computing models, how accurate are they when they respond today? Okay, here you, you have to separate the, um, the signal processing in two parts. You have the Physical processing, which human has, and computer has, because they have computer have microphones, they have cameras. Um, so, 
for example, a camera nowadays is not as close as the definition of the human eyes, for example. So the first part of the equation is we have a lot of uh, advancements we made in, in terms of the physical psych signal processing. Then you have the cognitive part. And the cognitive part, I will try to separate in different uh, tasks, different type of tasks of reasoning. You have inductive reasoning, which you have multiple observations and you go to a likely true explanation of something. You have abductive reasoning, which one example that has the best fit explanation of something, then you have deductive reasoning, uh, clue facts, and then you have a certain explanation. And then you have diffusible reasoning, uh, reasoning, which is the kind of reasoning that is rationally compelling, but there's no full explanation of the claim. Uh, one expert, I am Argentinian, one expert in this topic, Guillermo Simari, which is, uh, ha has been researching a lot about this topic. Um, and now, for instance, in terms of machine learning, which would be associated with inductive reasoning, you have uh, a lot of, of data, especially when you have big data. Uh, of course, you you, you will, um, especially when you have like millions of, of registries, millions of multiple observations, um, machine learning is much more optimal than a decision that can make a human, for sure. Uh, and also deep learning in sometimes uh, you, you will see that you you just um, you can classify an image uh, from from millions and millions of observation and it's and sometimes classified so accurate that uh, I mean sometimes I don't know if a human would be able to do that but it depends because most of the machine learning um, models would depend on the quality of the model. And in machine learning, it's not that important, the algorithm, but what is most important is the quality of the data. So the quality of the data determines whether it could um, outperform a human in certain tasks or not. But definitely, definitely what they actually can do now is to assist humans in making decisions to predict uh, the value of certain stock, to predict the value or to associate two different business values or different business metrics used for business intelligence. Um, and I, I think, as I said, decision-making, for sure, decision-making is, is what cognitive computing enables. No, that I, I, I hear you on that, but you made a statement that the, they, they will assist humans to make decisions. Does that mean that these cognitive systems of today they cannot operate without human supervision and they would uh, be they, they are at a point where they will only assist humans in taking decisions no now with this most of the systems act um we the proper name of of cognitive computing solution for me is intelligent agents most of the intelligent agents um or augmented intelligent systems are developed to assist the human to make the decision, not necessarily to, to make the decision for them. So answering this question is supervised, but the learning, the learning can be unsupervised. Now the decision making, usually these systems are made to, to assist the human and not act autonomously. It differs from different technology. For instance, you have the autonomous cars or the autonomous vehicles where in that certain problem you you want the car to act on, on behalf of of the environment but uh normally what what is known as connected computer is more like assisting the human uh, okay. it's that's what i i try to differentiate between ai and cognitive computing because sometimes it's like getting confused yes very true very true so how would you define and describe cognitive computing as it stands today and what is it what are the characteristics of these cognitive systems that has allowed them to be interactive with humans as we see today well first of all cognitive computing i think the characteristic that made a con cognitive computing solution is that first of all you have a signal processing you have signal processing tasks, meaning that you 
uh, analyze certain input information. This is executed by a computer, which could be called an intelligent agent. Aiming to make different uh, mental processes, normally associated with the basic process, uh, mental processes as memory, attention, perception, but limited to a cognitive and computational aspect. Why I remark on this? Perception in humans, not in cognitive computing, is more complex, meaning that you have physics, you have psychophysics, you have neurobiology, you have cognitive uh, aspects, processes, and then you have hormonal processes. It's more complex. Now in cognitive computing, you only focus on the cognitive aspect. What, me what is the meaning of the cognitive aspect is information processing and behavior retrieval. Could be a behavior retrieval is the agent acts on himself, is autonomous, or could be behavior recommendation. It recommends certain action to be made to a human. I see, I see. I, I, I understand that. So now, as compared to computing, what is the goal of cognitive computing? What is the cognitive computing community trying to, you know, achieve? Because of these capabilities and potentials that we have today, are we trying to build machines that can think for themselves? Is that the goal? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think uh, there's a lot of, of research group trying to to develop what is known of artificial general intelligence, but I, I think the the main um, outcome, the, the main likely outcome is to to benefit from these solutions, um, from assisting assisting humans and definitely not not trying to replace them. In, I work in automation, and I think in automation you have two different approaches. One is strictly what is known as automation, and then you have um, augmented intelligence, would be try to augment the capabilities of humans, meaning that making better decisions, providing information, information processing uh, accurately and fast, um, and help the human. So I think it's a tool but it's not definitely a replacement of, of, of a human in any sense at the moment. And I don't think it would be the right approach to, to continue further development of a cognitive computing system, trying to, to replace entirely what a human does. Because uh, at the end of the day, technology is a tool. At the end of the day, technology enables to do things that we couldn't do before. And if it do the opposite, it won't be a, a true technology. Yes, of course, you understand that. Now, we, we don't, uh, we are still, you know, the cognitive computing is still an emerging, you know, discipline, emerging field. And we haven't figured out all the answers to all the complex questions. But from what we know today, broadly speaking, what can cognitive computing do? Okay, you have different tasks, for instance, in one in terms of signal processing. Uh, you have object detection, you have um, also uh, object tracking, which is related to computer vision. Then you have the machine learning traditional tasks, which is classification, trying to classify certain data, regression, trying to predict certain value, a clustering, trying to group certain information. Um, some some use cases that I would um, try to explain, for instance, is in business intelligence. For instance, uh, there's something that is now augmented intelligence assistant, which is basically all the information processed by machine learning, the predictions, uh, all these insights that you have in machine learning, put it in the business intelligence dashboard, and then uh, using, for instance, a chatbot interface to try to uh, figure out certain information. And, and this would be related with behavioral recommendations. So let's say, for instance, I am a financial manager and I, I have seen so, so data of, let's say, sales. So I want a prediction on how the uh, sales would be related to the amount of emails uh, the sales department sent. Um, I have this information 
And based on this information, I can use uh, augmented intelligent assistance through this interface of chatbot, chatbot to, let's say, okay, what, uh, what decision should we make consider, considering value A, value B, and value C? And the agent would say, considering this decision, the optimal decision would be uh, X, Y, and, and Z. Um, so you also have another, um, I think, which is emerging application, uh, which is federated learning. Federated learning is the, the practice of separating computer tasks of machine learning in different computers. Google is using this and it's actually very efficient. Um, so, so I think those are the main uh, applications which are related to what uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms can actually do. No, that that's very really interesting. Maybe we should have a separate discount of dialogue for that particular, you know, uh, yeah. point that you made. So, where are cognitive computing branded technology platforms applied today? Where do you see the applications across industries? Okay, for example, um, IBM Watson have used uh, what is they he had they have a program called IBM Watson for Health, which uh, basically uh, they. They use a lot of data from, from patients to predict the, um, the likelihood of how of different um, cancer uh, diagnosis. So at some point, is diagnosing better than a professional doctor, which is a really amazing case. Um, this is one case. Then you have uh, algorithmic trading. Uh, there are some algorithmic trades around this um, technology. One of the initiatives I really like is OpenAI, of course. You have the what is known the GIM, which is an open source reinforcement learning simulation environment to so experiment with uh, algorithms. And then one of the, the projects that I really love is called Numenta. It has a, it's, has a technology that tries to differentiate from deep learning. Is called hierarchical temporary memory system. It follows the Hevian theory, which is a theory in neuroscience that proposes an explanation for the adaptation of the neurons in the brain during the learning process. So basically what um, Numenta project wants to do is try to create a system exactly how the neocortex of the brain works, which it's different from the learning, because deep learning has some um, limitations. These limitations are like they they need a huge amount of data to work properly. They also need a huge amount of computation power, meaning that you have also you also need a lot of time. And this project is uh, starting to to be in the industry. And I think there is a lot of potential applications. It's something that it's really in an early stage, but it's definitely something that it's a must see in the industry. And it was developed the first time in 2005, but I think it's a massive project. In addition to that, I said um, Open open Mind, which is a federated learning platform, I think it would have a tremendous use because uh, imagine the possibility of different data science to, to have the possibility to, to have an economy towards the, the lending of computer powers to other data scientists and also lending data. I think you now we have a new economy which is not based on, it's, it's based on shops, but it would be likely and step by step would be more focus on data rather than shops. It's another change I think in, in the computed, in the cognitive computing industry. Very true, very true. Now, con cognitive computing, it seems to be extending computing to new set of complexity, human ambiguous problems, but is it uh, applicable in every context? When can humans or, you know, uh, 
the developers or the AI community or the cognitive computing community, when can they use cognitive uh, computing and when they should not be using it? For what kind of problems this is an ideal solution, cognitive computing, and for what kind of problems this is not necessary and we can just switch to the basic uh, computing that we have been doing over the years? Well, that's a, a good question because nowadays it's, there is a trend to, to use AI in everything. I think, as, uh, as I said, it depends on, on the technology. But in a broad sense, cognitive computing, as said several times, for me, this, the, the main problem that's solved is decision-making assistant. Then you have machine learning problems. When you use machine learning, would be only problems that have a huge amount of data. You have um, features. You already manually extracted the features. And then you need an algorithm that improve performance over over the experience that are the the differentials that i think in for instance in machine learning um but as i said it would it would de depend in, in the type of problem that you need the tool that you use and the promise that i would use is mostly for business intelligence decisions i think like assistance of business uh, decisions which are strategic and have a huge amount of variables. When you have, I don't know, you have a problem, a decision-making problem, but it's only, uh, you, you only consider one variable, it's very straightforward, you will use uh, basic common sense. You don't need a, a computer to, to act with you. But you only use this, I think, when you have huge amount of data, huge amount of stimuli over there catching your, your attention. And, uh, so, so yeah, I, I think it's mostly business intelligence problems that that would be would use. It. I, I don't, I won't use it for uh, a normal, uh, I don't know, automation problems such as automating a data entry problem, for instance, sure. uh, or or tasks that are very repetitive. Maybe um, you would use a normal heuristic based program. Um, good, point, good point. No, that's true. That's true. Now, because cognitive computing can be programmed to learn and solve problems, complex problems facing humanity, cognitive computing systems are becoming disruptive to many industries, including if you see healthcare or financial services, as you mentioned before, or you know, marketing or customer intelligence or security. Irrespective of where you you know look at the complex problems facing industries these industries are going to be disrupted because of the power of the cognitive computing. So from your assessment, where is cognitive computing making a real difference right now? Well, I think that the cognitive computing is a very, very, very early stage. But if you ask me, I would say healthcare because of the diagnosis uh, potential, like the automated diagnosis potential also financial industry because of the algorithmic trading but there's a lot of, to do yet i think uh, so i don't see that there are some industry now totally disrupted by uh, what is now a cognitive computing there's i think it would take some at least one or two years more to see a, an industry completely disrupted by cognitive computing and i think when that happens would mean a, sh a shift in not only an industry, but a macroeconomy, because uh, I see that we will move towards something that is um, different jobs. We have different jobs, not necessarily no jobs, but different jobs. Yes. Uh, Gini Rometti from IBM, the last year coined the term new collar jobs, which are more related to a more creative or more cognitive oriented um, jobs. And I think that there would be a transition. So it would take time. Now, I don't think that now there's a real true disruption in cognitive computing at all. There's a lot of hype and misinterpretations of what it can do, what uh, there's a lot of companies investing a huge amounts of, of, of money on marketing to display the, the, the solutions. But I think there's still a lot to do. I don't see disruption at the moment, at the moment, but I see potential. Yes, there is a huge potential, but you are right that it is still too early. Now, in many ways, 
cognitive computing is a natural extension of the existing analytical projects which you know uh, businesses across industries are focusing on currently now the challenge for technology and business leaders both is to look for areas where cognitive computing can be applied to complex business problems so what should business and technology leaders do to get the most out of cognitive computing today what what way how should they think about this uh, complex problems and what they should be thinking about when they think about using cognitive computing i think there is a big problem in the industry general industry uh, i mean in general and all, all over the world and is that uh, business managers tend to focus a lot a lot on the technology and in, in the solution um, to, to be competitive. Uh, it happens to me when I have clients that says, okay, there's AI, cognitive computing, automation, I want to apply this. And they don't really know how it will impact in the business, but they want to do it because in order to stay competitive in the industry. So I would suggest to the business manager to, to try to understand what the problem really is, what the problem they want to solve. And I start from this and then try to figure out how cognitive computing can help. Because uh, sometimes you need a more transdisciplinary approach where you, you use different um, approaches. It could be more heuristic, more programmatic based, more hand-coded. Sometimes you really need some AI solutions. So, I would suggest to, to the, the business in general to, to try to understand technology a bit more, try to focus a bit more on the problem rather than going straight forward to the solution and say, okay, I want to be competitive and that's it. Yes, very true, very true. Now, the potential use cases for cognitive systems are very broad and they are very diverse and rich. You know, you can use any imagination to the complex problems you want to solve. So where do you see you, especially as you interact with all your clients and as you, you know, talk with the fellow, you know, technology leaders, business leaders, uh, decision makers, where do you see the power of more information, intelligence and automation as seen by you today? I think that would be mostly apply in high level um, shops, in high level uh, working environments, I think it would be like creating the the working environments of the future. We are not necessarily you don't work, you you have a shop, but you you have dashboards where you make decisions. You have you you make your own set of uh, automation algorithms to to try to automate what you do, like the repetitive tasks, and then focus on the more strategic parts. And I think it would be more dynamic, for sure, it would be definitely more dynamic, uh, very changing, like changing every... Now we, we are living in a really changing environment, but I think it would definitely change that for sure. Um, so, so answering that question, I think marketing, financial decisions financial decision would be critical would be critical cognitive computing a solution for financial uh, marketing uh, for financial and marketing departments i think communication which is also related with with market i think is very important to understand what the people what the people think what the people like what the people uh, want to to see what they their they beliefs try to understand a bit more what what the data the data tells to you. Um, so all people that use data to work are definitely impacted by cognitive computing and they will change their shops in the sense that they will need to, to acquire more technological skills. No matter what you, you study, if you make decisions, you will need uh, yeah. technological skills. Yes, very true. Now, cognitive computing is a very powerful tool, but it is a tool, I think, you know, from what you are telling me, that it is a tool and the humans, uh, you know, can have this tool and they can decide how best to use it for decision making. So from your assessment, 
as to the advances that we see in cognitive computing, what are the strengths and weaknesses of cognitive computing? Are there any problems in the cognitive base, uh, computing based systems today? Or, you know, do you not see any complex challenges or you see that some things needs to be, some technological problems needs to be solved before we can get the real uh, promise and potential of cognitive computing? That's an amazing question. Um, there's a lot actually of challenges. Um, first of all, I, I will start with the strengths. I think the strengths, as I said, is that uh, it can help humans to make very, very complex decisions in a very efficient way, which is the main strength. And I think the main use case, as I said over and over the time in, in this uh, dialogue. Uh, but there has a lot of there are a lot of limitations. First of all, I think that uh, one of the limitations is that it's, it is biased in a sense that it's only focused on the cognitive aspect of information processing. Information processing, as said, it's all a combination of different aspects which involves, as said, physics, psychophysics, neurobiology, uh, cognition, normal so what i think is missing is the um, biological sense i don't think we we will have really cognitive computing if we don't add this um biological biological factor to the equation of cognitive computing and then so I, I predict that would be uh, back to the analogical back to to what is analogical we, we had the first industrial revolution, which was the digital revolution. We, we had a switch between the digital technology to, to the analogical technology to the digital. But now I think there would be another shift in, in back to, to the analogy, the analogical part. So and then you have another limitations, for instance, in certain technology of deep learning. Uh, deep learning works with stat static data sets. It's good at low level, but of perceptual tasks, but it requires a lot of amount of data. It's consumed a lot of consumer power, which is, um, it's, it's a problem unless computer powers increase dramatically, which could happen, but it's still a, a limitation nowadays. Uh, and then another more broader challenge that I see is that we need to, to develop sustainable frameworks of development of AI to address global grand challenges. I, I think that a technology with this potential of the ripeness of uh, information processing as this, it's only would be helpful, would be only would be useful. It is used to address challenges and have the, the humanity in the global aspect. That is why globalization should be for good and not for, for bad. Yes. This is one of the, of the things and claims that I do. Now, um, I think that there's also risk in terms of cognitive computing. And I would separate the risk in four different categories. First of all, you have the algorithmic bias. So you have a lot of algorithms that what they're doing, even though you, you can have a huge amount of data, which could be really compelling evidence of a claim, uh, you are still making a claim with an algorithm. It, it's a claim. Uh, and this, I, this is biased in the sense that um, it's a set of observations, but not necessarily the true. And you, there's multiple factors that maybe you are not considering or the algorithm is not considering. Uh, so, you, you have always the bias factor, which is, I think, is very important. Then you have the techno ethics. I, I told you about the uh, intelligent agents that, that make decisions or help humans to make decisions. But about the uh, intelligent agent that recommends uh, a human to make a wrong decisions, or what about an intelligent agent that make a wrong decision? Who who will be accountable? What where is the accountability? So there you have an issue. Then you have the what is known as the quantum supremacy, which I think is related to the risk of decentralized AI, which is nowadays used the blockchain uh, network to, 
to power this off, basically Ethereum or the interplanetary file system, all these frameworks that are decentralized, which are based on hash uh, calculations. And if you have quantum supremacy, uh, which nowadays you need a lot of years to develop, in my opinion, but it's just still a threat. And finally, you have, as every technology, I think there's a risk of misuse because uh, I don't know, you, you can create uh, certain agent, uh, autonomous vehicle to, uh, I don't know, to classify certain people, to track certain people and to uh, hurt or danger, endanger sort of people. It's completely feasible. And, and again, who will be accountable of doing this uh, misuse of this technology? Um, so that, that I think that would be the threats and the challenges in, in cognitive computing nowadays. Yes, no, that's excellent analysis. And uh, I hear you on that. Those are excellent points. And we all have to collectively work together to come up with solutions because it's not about only technology developers. It's also about the whole ecosystem because, uh, we, like you said, you know, we need to make sure that there is an accountability. If we are developing any system, we need to make sure that someone is accountable and then we can manage the complex challenges in the proper way. But if we are to advance the era of cognitive systems. There are many who feel that a shared agenda is needed to drive the era of cognitive computing because the, there should be shared goals, the shared positive goals for the betterment of the humanity. So the, the shared goals are very important. Do you see the need for shared agenda at this point? Absolutely, absolutely, I think it's critical for every technology, but especially for AI and cognitive computing because obviously it's, one of the most promising technologies uh, nowadays, as well with blockchain, which I, I think it, it, the, ne the, the future of AI is, is the merge between AI and blockchain, definitely the centralized and distributed AI platforms. Now, here's the thing, and the problem I, I see is that we have all this data, which is true, it's enabled, uh, cognitive computer and AI. We also have computing power decently increased. But now my question is, is that computer power, is that data really distributed or is just only a few powerful have a lot of, of, of this data and own this data? Because there's a problem, I think there is an issue in ownership of the data. We generate a lot of the data and represents a lot of money, but we don't have the utility of, of this value that we generate to, to others. So I think that there's an ethical problem on that, a very amazing ethical problem on that. And that's why we can speak about sustainable development of AI without merging AI and blockchain. Doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be completely decentralized, it doesn't have to be completely distributed, but the main point is to generate a system where everyone can contribute with data, with algorithms, with knowledge, whatever, but AI should be for good and should be not for a few, but for, for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. And blockchain has to be the digital infrastructure for any systems. I mean, irrespective of whether it's a cognitive computing system or financial system or a risk management system. I think we all need to build that on the blockchain because that will give us transparency, accountability, and it will be so much easier to uh, manage the complex uh, challenges that we see with the current systems today. And uh, I mean, we have... Uh, I, we don't have that much time today. You know, it's only one hour dialogue, but I would love to talk about, you know, industry applications, specifically what we see today, but we won't go through all the industries, but one that is very, you know, dear to my heart and what is, uh, what I'm very passionate about is the security industry. So let's talk about the potential of cognitive computing for cybersecurity. I mean, it seems that 
from currently what we when we analyze all the available solutions for cybersecurity that we don't have effective systems that can block threats uh, cybersecurity threats or eliminate human error i mean there's so many human errors happening you know across uh, nations across businesses we all go through uh, that kind of uh, complex challenges and uh, we cannot protect the important you know data and assets that we have in cyberspace so it seems that we need a cognitive computing uh, solution that is based on predictive analytics the uh, for the uh, se uh, security of the cyberspace so do you see cognitive computing transforming cybersecurity in the coming years with what uh, technology uh, potential and advances we have today i don't see cognitive computing alone transforming uh, cybersecurity, but I see, and now I, I try, I will try to be more precise because before I said blockchain, but what I should say actually is the distributed ledger. Yes. Because actually blockchain, uh, it's not perfect. It's, it's, it, it's not necessarily the, the best solution for distributed ledger. Um, answering your question, I think that no, compute, computing, uh, cognitive computing alone, I don't see how it will help to cyber security, but uh, different distributed layers, for instance, uh, Tangle. Tangle is one example of, of which is used, is the Tangle network is used by the, the new cryptocurrency IOTA, which is distributed in a sense that there's no fee. It's um, more distributed uh, ledger than the blockchains more effective. Oh, it's um, more effective than blockchain. Yeah, yeah. I, IOTA is one. It's like, it considered like a third generation cryptocurrency, which nice. Cardano as well. Cardano and IOTA are two of the third generation um, cryptocurrency. The second generation you have Ethereum, which enabled the smart contracts uh, facility. Um, so I don't think, for instance, a smart contract enter to the category of cognitive computing, but some some people relate to artificial intelligence and autonomous uh, agents. So I think that there would be a system of collecting data in different computers, like in a distributed ledger network, could be a blockchain, could be a tangle. Uh, we don't know, but with these ledgers uh, works with the blockchain, meaning that you you have a public key, you have a, a, you have a hash, uh, you have a hashing algorithm, um, which enable you to decrypt a message uh, on on this data collection. Um, and, and then you have another problem in, in blockchain that I think it will change in, in terms of security is that even though it's very secure in, in the blockchain, you, every node, every user have a copy of all the data of the transactions generated. So imagine is, I don't know, Bitcoin is massively adopted. Imagine each node of, of, of having all this information. Yes, it would be definitely something not easy to, to hack, completely impossible unless you have a quantum computer, um, but still not so efficient. So you have a trade-off between um, being comfortable or having facilities to store data safely and, and, and do it efficiently. I so I it's, it's not just cognitive computer. I, again, I don't see cognitive computer in in cyberspace but i see smart contracts second and third generation cryptocurrencies involved in that and only only i see the how this could be effect is that the other way around cyber security would be affected by a distributed ledger mm -hmm. and distributed ledger will impact in cognitive computing which is different. I don't think cognitive computing directly will impact in cybersecurity. I understand. So what about electronic warfare? Do you think that cognitive computing systems would be able to assist human decision makers in uh, 
tell, telling them whether you know an electronic attack is on the way to that would destroy their digital infrastructure do you see that kind of capability emerging in the coming years i don't i honestly don't, don't see that that happening um i think this is in a very early stage and yes, it is very early very unfortunately early. there's a lot of claims of developments of uh, advancement but i don't see that coming uh, uh maybe i'm too cautious uh, but uh, sure, sure. it's what i what i would think is you you have to be you have to go in technology you have to go step by step and always focus on the problem you you want to solve and yes maybe yes. fractionalize this problem in True. very few steps no i understand that no we it is still very early and we'll have to wait for you know few years to see how it is shaping what kind of technological advances are happening that would allow us to come up with the solutions for such complex problems because this is a very complex problem it is i mean whether security in cyberspace security in geospace and security in space and uh, these kind of uh, warfare that is emerging electronic warfare to cyber warfare to nano warfare and all that we would need you know systems cognitive computing systems that can assist humans to uh, and help them take the right decisions at the right time but let's talk about the who are the key players today who is leading the cognitive computing space uh, currently well you have different players uh, i have to mention uh, OpenAI, I think, is one of the, the key players because it has an open source environment to, to which makes this organization exponential. In a sense that there are different um, data scientists all over the world improving uh, and testing different reinforcement learning algorithms to experiment their, themselves in very... Um, in very easily to understand the environment. So I think it's one of the key players at the moment. Then as I said, Numenta, I think is one of the key players because they, while for instance, deep learning is based on the mathematical model of um, Macaulay and Pitts, which is, as, as I mentioned before, was published in 1943. Numenta is a company that's directly focused on how the the front the the frontal cortex work in the brain the frontal the neocortex of the brain is the the part of the brain that is specifically designed to make decisions so they focus exactly on how it works so i think one of the key players at the moment because of that and is actually trying to shift from the deep learning and machine learning based ai to uh, the hierarchical, hierarchical temporal memory system, which is uh, their system that they use in Numenta. Numenta is the company, the organization, and HDM is like the technology. Then I think you have some neuromorphic engineering um, concepts, which is uh, IBM True North. It's a neuromorphic CMOS integrated circuit. Produced in 2014. It's like an improvement of uh, DARPA Synapse. It's basically a um, computer, which it's it's analog of how the the brains and the synapses are. Uh, so it's it's kind of uh, trying to simulate in an in analog way of how the, the neurons connect and make uh, synapses. I think it's one of the approach, uh, as I said. Uh, one of the shifts that should be made in cognitive computing is the addition to the biological part of the neuromorphic part. So I think one of the key players. And then you have uh, Intel has Loi, which is a chip. It's a fully uh, asynchronous neuromorphic uh, main core mesh that supports a wide range of spurs, hierarchical and recurrent neural network topologies. It's again like it's a, a chip which is uh, analog of how the, the brain works and it's really efficient. So I, I think these are the most relevant players at the moment. I can also mention Open Mind, which is the, the platform for federative learning. Uh, those are the other players for, for either for 
shifting the, the technology, either for having them from a more digital approach to an analogical approach, or either to try to decentralize the data storage and the training of the data. Those yes. are the reasons I think makes a difference. Yes, very true, very true. Now that's a good background on all the key players. Now let's talk about you and your organization and your efforts uh, towards cognitive computing. Uh, what cognitive uh, computing projects are you and your organization working on currently, if you can share publicly? If you cannot share, you know, we don't need to talk about that. Oh, no, no worries. Well, um, we have been working in basically automation processes. There are different types of automation and different like um, hierarchies of automation. But one of, of our use cases was with uh, FedEx. Uh, with FedEx in Argentina, they wanted to automate. They have a data entry, which uh, every day fills hundreds and hundreds of um, of registries from a, a CSV file to a taxi system. In Argentina, in order to make uh, international couriers, you have to, to fill a form and you have to do it manually. So basically, we develop a, a system that extracts, um, goes to the automatically log into the page of um, <clears throat> the page to the to the taxing system, fills all the information, extracts the data from a CSV file, uh, takes one column, fill the automatically fill the form, and then uh, the answer is extract the answer from the the browser and it's. A structure, a structure, all the data in a new table. So, you, from a CS file, you have another CS file with uh, the answers or the validation that you have, which is automatically, and that saves a lot of time. In a human, do that every day, like taking four hours non-stop, and with this automation solution, you can do it in less than one hour. So you save a lot of a lot of time, a lot of money, and these employees can now work in more strategic tasks. So that's okay. the way I think it can transform in different aspects. Another, for instance, another uh, projects or uh, another products that we are developing is uh, recommendation systems for uh, e-commerce, basically. So uh, using a huge amount of data to determine where um, the likelihood of a, a consumer to consume or buy certain product rather to the other or associate some product to the other, which is very typical in the e-commerce industry. Great. We would love to see your progress in the coming years. Now, what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners, especially to the young minds who are trying to develop cognitive system? Well, I, I think that the main, the main message I would say is to don't try to think cognitive computing as something that is or something that is for fun, but instead trying to to look at one certain decision making problem, one specifically, and try to think how a computer would solve it, how uh, how which algorithm would you use to solve that problem, and of course read read a lot. Uh, have projects, uh, but another another advice I would say is that those problems always focus on the problems and try to learn from the the problems you solve. But those problems try to to focus on problems that are meaningful or have an impact in your in your life or the life of the others. For instance, I I always love to learn about cognitive computing or these systems by trying to solve problems. For my surroundings, let's say uh, I don't know. I have a friend that needs to make a decision, so I try to automate the different values and things to make this decision. It's just an example, but um, I think this is the way to 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 learn and to make an impact while learning. Yes, no, that that is an excellent advice and uh, excellent suggestions for the young, brilliant minds who want to make a difference in the world. So thank you so much, Patricio, for no participating worries. in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on cognitive computing and for doing your part 
in shaping it and helping raise awareness about it. Our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the information you provided on cognitive computing and the, talked about the challenges, uh, risk and rewards it brings to the society. So even if a single individual or entity can come up with an idea to help advance cognitive computi computing, this risk roundup dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. I am extremely grateful to, for your invitation. Thank you so much. So while today much of cognitive computing seems transformative and revolutionary, in the coming years, these type of human computer interaction in joint uh, decision making with real time applications will likely be as common as air, food and water. The decisions we take today will determine how cognitive systems and humans will work in parallel for the benefit of humanity. Risk group cybersecurity, geosecurity, and space security risk research centers are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIOA in CGS, that means nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace they walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, Risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risks together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundups, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.